Welcome to this series, A Conceptual Introduction to Item Response Theory. Before we start, I want to say a little bit about how this series is structured. There are 109 slides in this presentation, but the whole thing lasts about an hour. That's going through all six sections. However, I don't think it's a good idea to sit down and try to do the whole thing at one sitting. There's six parts and each one's around 10 minutes long. That makes it very easy if you want to view one, for example, during your lunch hour. This stuff really needs a while to sink in. One of the reasons I made each section so short is to encourage you to review sections when you're not sure you got it all or when you want to improve your mastery of a section. But whatever you do, don't just plunge into the next section without really understanding what's gone before. I also think that you'll find that by cycling back through the modules, you will deepen your understanding of the concepts. So finally, I want to say that I'd really like to hear your comments about each module. I'm trying to make them better and better and, and really need your help in that. My me email is on the very first slide of this presentation, and you'll also find it repeated on the last slide of each section. So let me hear from you. So let's get started with part one, the logic of IRT scoring. I want to emphasize that this presentation is conceptual and not mathematical in its strategy and approach. For some that will be a disappointment, but I suspect for others it will be a relief. There will be some math, but I'll warn you ahead of time. At the risk of being pedantic, I'm going to start with the definition of measurement. Stevens called measurement assigning numbers to objects or events according to a rule. In the next few slides, I'm going to contrast two different strategies in measurement, classical measurement and item response theory. And what you're going to see is that these two methods have very different rules for assigning numbers. Whether you're using classical measurement or item response theory, the goal is the same. You want to align people on a continuum from low to high or from sicker to healthier. Suppose you want to measure pain, for example. The goal of measurement is to discriminate among people who have low pain, who have high pain, and every level in between. If your measurement strategy works well, then you can make fine distinctions among different levels of pain. Now before we get too far, let's start with the most well-known approach to measurement, and it's called classical test theory. Classical test theory is also known as true score theory, and as the name implies, it's a theory-based approach. This is the theory. The theory is that the scores that you obtain for persons on a measure, their observed scores, are made up of two parts. Their true score, something you can never really know by the way, plus the error in, in, that's inherent in measurement. Of course, the more the true part and the less the error part, the more reliable your measurement. Remembering Stevens' definition of measurement as assigning numbers to objects or events according to rules, we can now ask what are the rules of measurement in classical test theory? I'm going to answer that question using an example, the pain interference subscale of the brief pain inventory, also called the BPI. This BPI subscale has seven items, and each of them asks about how much pain interferes with different activities and functions. Each of the seven items is scored from 0 to 10. Something worth noting about the rules used in classical test theory is that an assumption is being made. And that assumption is that everyone is responding to the same items. The scoring system really doesn't work very well if one person answers four items and another answers all seven. And if you have missing responses, you have to come up with a rule about that. You might decide not to calculate a score for them, or you might decide to average the scores on the item they res all, all the items that they did respond to, and then multiply by the total number of items. And this will get you a number a bit. It could be problematic because all items are not created equal. That's why researchers go to a lot of trouble to get complete responses to a scale. I want to emphasize this point with a hypothetical example. Later I'll use a pain example, but this idea is a lot easier to explain if I use an example or use the example of measuring physical function. For this example, I've created two androgynous, brightly colored people and named them Jean and Robin. We're going to measure their shoulder function. For our purposes, I've made up a shoulder scale that asks persons to report how much difficulty they have with different tasks and the tasks that are going to be listed require varying levels of shoulder function. 
Remember that measurement is the assigning of numbers according to rules. So here are the rules for this measurement scale. A person has five choices when responding to an item, and these choices range from no difficulty to cannot do. The numbers associated with these responses are 0 to 4. To get a person's shoulder function score, you add up the number associated with each item response and get a total score. Here are the items that are presented to Jean. How much difficulty do you have reaching your earlobe, picking up a glass of water, and pulling a chair out from a table? Jean's responses are in order little difficulty, some difficulty, and much difficulty. The corresponding scores for these responses are 3, 2, and 1. So now I apply the rule, add up the scores, and find that Jean has a total score of 6. Now Robin has presented three items. But notice that we are ignoring the assumption that everybody is going to take the same items. Robin is asked about difficulty hanging a heavy coat, putting a half-gallon jug on a shelf, and pulling something heavy from the back seat of a car into the front seat. Robin's responses are in order, little difficulty, some difficulty, and much difficulty. The corresponding scores for these responses are 3, 2, and 1. Now I apply the rule, and I add the scores up to get a total score. Robin is given a score of 6. Here you see Jean and Robin's answers side by side. Notice that though they were given different items, their responses were the same. There's, they had the same response pattern, is how we say it. Thus, on this test of shoulder function, both Jean and Robin have a score of 6. However, you can tell that one of these androgynous, brightly colored, hypothetical persons has higher shoulder function than the other. Who has a higher shoulder function? Go ahead, say the name aloud. I won't judge you. I'm guessing that you rightly guessed that Robin has the higher shoulder function. The chin-ups might have given it away, but even without the animation, you would have figured it out. You may have reasoned something like this. Jean and Robin had the same response pattern, 3, 2, 1, corresponding to responses of little difficulty, some difficulty, and much difficulty. But Robin's items were a lot harder. Therefore, Robin has the higher shoulder function. Now I'm going to say the same thing, but in a slightly different way. When you figured this out, you discriminated between Jean and Robin's shoulder function this way. You took what you knew about the items. You could tell that some were harder than others. And then you added to that knowledge what I told you about how Jean and Robin responded to each item. And then you made an educated guess about who had the higher shoulder function. Notice what you did not use to make your guess. You did not consider the fact that both Jean and Robin had a score of six. In fact, if you had used this, you would have made a bad guess. As you work your way through the other modules in this series, you will see that IRT uses the same logic in discriminating levels or trait. It takes what is known about items, this will include difficulty and may include item discrimination, and it takes into account the pattern of item responses for each individual. And then it makes an estimate of each person's most likely level of the trait being measured. You can think of this estimate as equivalent to your educated guess in the previous exercise. That's it for part one. Now you have a definition of measurement, and you're beginning to understand that there's more than one way to assign numbers according to rules. Though we haven't gone into a lot of detail yet, you may be suspecting that IRT has very different rules than those of classical methods. In part two, we'll get a little more into the weeds of how IRT is used to score a measure. Part two is titled, IRT is a probability model. And in it, I'm going to explain what it means in general for IRT to be a model, and specifically what it means that IRT is a probability model. As always, I want you to be sure and send me any suggestions or comments that you have, and you see right there, there's my email. 